Good afternoon to all of you on the East Coast and good morning to you if you are on the West Coast. My name is Dr. Jose Leon. I am the Clinical Quality Manager at the National Center for Health and Public Housing, a project of North American Management. I want to welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar, uh, Implementing Effective HIV Programs for People in Public Housing. This webinar is being recorded and the resources the slides and other materials will be emailed to you after the webinar has finished. At the end of this webinar, there will be a question and answer session. I would like to thank to say thank you to uh, HERSA for allowing us to make this webinar possible through a publication grant number U30CS09734. Um, I'd like to uh, get it started and uh, I would like to share some uh, information with you. Uh, approximately 1.1 million people in the United States are living with HIV. Close to one in five of those infected are not aware that they are infected. Although African Americans are only 13 percent of the U.S. population, they accounted for 44 percent of HIV infection cases in 2010. Hispanics accounted for 20 percent of eight cases in 2011, despite making up only 17 percent of the U.S. population. Uh, Low-income heterosexuals are up to 20 times more likely to become infected with HIV than the rest of the U.S. population. 2.1 percent of heterosexuals living in high-poverty urban areas were HIV positive. Uh, it is an honor for me to introduce uh, the speaker for today's uh, webinar, uh, Dr. Harvey Macadon. He is the uh, clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of the National LGBT Health Education Center at the Fenway Institute, a division of Fenway Health in Boston. He is a member of the Division of General Medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, where he has had a primary care practice and served as Vice President of Medical Affairs. He is currently the LGBT advisor in Harvard Medical School's Office for Recruitment and Multicultural Affairs. Dr. McAdam is the lead editor of the Fenway Guide to Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender Health, published by the American College of Physicians. In addition to writing numerous articles and chapters related to LGBT health, he served on the Committee on LGBT Health Issues and Research Gaps and Opportunities of the Institute of Medicine of the U.S., National Academy of Science, Sciences for the Health of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender People, building a foundation for better understanding in March 2011. Dr. McAdam was the recipient of the Community Service Award in 2000 and the Harold Amos Diversity Award in 2008 at Harvard Medical School, an Achievement Award from the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, and the Michael Tai Leadership Award in 2004 from uh, Fengui uh, Health. I am now uh, turning this uh, presentation over to Dr. McAdam. Good afternoon, Dr. McAdam. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Leon. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about this important topic um, today. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to really focus on is uh, as health centers what we can do to implement effective HIV programs for people, particularly people in public housing or people who need public housing. The LGBT Health Education Center uh, is funded by HRSA as a national cooperative agreement to do work uh, with community health centers. We provide training and technical assistance. We also do other types of programs um, and have a number of resources and publications on our website. Uh, the web address will be at the end of the talk, but it's also on this slide uh, for people who are interested in looking up more information or getting CME credits on related topics. Uh, as Dr. Leon said, Fenway is based at Fenway Health, a FQHC in Boston. And the Fenway Institute does research, education, and policy work and is part of the health center, which has as its mission enhancing the well-being of the LGBT community, as well as people in our neighborhoods 
but we do have an integrated primary care model which includes HIV services and behavioral health. Um, the learning objectives for this program are first I'm going to go over the state of the HIV epidemic and epidemiology of what we know regarding HIV transmission, talk about the state of access to HIV prevention and care for residents of public housing and in community health centers, and then describe the elements of effective HIV prevention and care and how to overcome barriers to achieving effective HIV programs. Uh, Dr. Leon already highlighted uh, some of the key facts about HIV AIDS in the United States. If there's about 1.2 million people infected, um, we have about 50,000 new cases of HIV diagnosed every year. And uh, that's something that hasn't changed in many years. Dr. Leon already talked about the disproportionate impact of HIV on the black and Latino populations. Uh, and that's something that is very critical in our uh, reaching the right people to bring an end to uh, the HIV epidemic in the United States. I think it's important, also important that we recognize that in terms of incidence of new cases of HIV, at about 66% of cases in 2010, the last year for which we have data from the Centers for Disease Control, uh, male-to-male sexual contact accounted for 66% uh, of cases in contrast to heterosexual contact, which was 26% of cases, and about 8% from injection drug use. So clearly, men who have sex with men in all communities, but particularly communities of color, are at high risk uh, for HIV. Um, this shows HIV incidence among men who have sex with men uh, based on race and ethnicity. And you can see, uh, once again, the numbers uh, of people in the black community who are between the ages of 13 and 24 accounted for the highest incidence of HIV in uh, 2010, uh, followed closely by uh, slightly older uh, African American men as well as uh, Hispanic men um, who were younger. Older eight, uh, men in the white community um, continue to be infected, which is also an issue that we have to be concerned about uh, as our population ages. If we look again at this summary slide, which looks at overall incidence of HIV, we see again that it's held stable on the top line in purple at 50,000 cases a year. And if we focus on the bottom line, we see the incidence among black young men who have sex with men between the ages of 13 and 24 increased by 60% between 2006 and 2010. I think it's important that we understand that the incidence among young black men who have sex with men is high, not because they engage in higher degrees of risk, but because they have barriers to healthcare access, they have lower rates of HIV testing, they have late access to screening and treatment for sexually transmitted infections, and they have a higher prevalence in their social network so that in any one sexual encounter, they're more likely to be uh, infected or to become infected. Um, I think it's important that we recognize that while the CDC doesn't break out this category, Transgender women are also at high risk for HIV. Overall HIV prevalence among transgender women is 19%, and the prevalence among black transgender women can be as high as 50%. This varies around the world, but it nevertheless is a significant number no matter where we are around the world, and is a significant problem for uh, the transgender community and we have to be thinking about this as we engage in outreach, testing, and linkage to care, that we have to be able to develop methods to uh, find uh, young transgender women so that we can help them prevent uh, getting infected with HIV. Um, I, don't, uh, I just wanted to return to what we know about HIV care in the United States. And if we look at the HIV treatment cascade, we see that as we go from uh, looking at the number of people who are infected to the number of people who are effectively managed, 
that only 25% of those who are infected in the country are being effectively managed for HIV with a suppressed viral load. And we have to think about all aspects of what we do to improve both prevention and care, beginning with outreach, counseling and testing, linkage to care, case management, engagement in care, and counseling people about adherence. And those are things that we're going to address during today's talk. I wanted to begin, though, by kind of highlighting the national HIV AIDS strategy. The vision of the national strategy is that the United States will become a place where new HIV infections are rare, and when they do occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic circumstance, will have unfettered access to high-quality, life-extending care, free from stigma and discrimination. And that our goals for the AIDS strategy are to reduce the number of those who become infected, to increase access to care and optimize health burdens for people living with HIV, to reduce HIV-related health disparities, and to achieve a more coordinated response uh, to the epidemic. Some specific goals that, the, that the, uh, have been set for the National AIDS Strategy for 2015, and I'm not going to read this whole slide, but are to reduce new infections, to increase access to care and improving health outcomes, and reduce HIV-related health disparities and health inequities. And this is something that I think all health centers can really do and be part of an, of an effort to really change the face of HIV in the United States and bring the number of new cases to zero by engaging in, in some relatively straightforward approaches uh, to uh, begin to end the epidemic. And that's what I wanted to highlight now. I wanted to highlight that the pathway for effective HIV management in the United States in health centers begins with universal HIV screening and ultimately leads to reducing the incidence of HIV by effectively dealing with people who are screened and who test positive and people who are screened and who test negative. And I'll now go through this, uh, these, these pieces. First, I want to focus on universal HIV screening. Um, as, as everyone probably knows, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which makes recommendations for all prevention tests, things like when you should do mammograms, when you should check cholesterol, also now has graded as their highest recommendation that all people in the United States should have an HIV screening test once between the ages of 15 and 65. Those who test positive need evaluation and treatment. Those who are negative but at high risk need to have ongoing testing. And testing is a prerequisite for treatment as prevention and any kind of prophylaxis against exposure to HIV called pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV infection. And I'll explain both of these concepts in just a minute. <clears throat> What's new in HIV testing it are that there are new testing algorithms with successive immunoassays to eliminate the uh, timely, time-taking and expensive Western blot test, which has been done in the past, that added specificity to the sensitivity of the initial ELISA tests. There's now a new fourth-generation test, which combines antibody tests and antigen tests to shorten the amount of time that people can be, that it takes to determine whether or not someone has been infected. And that's something that will be implemented over the next year or so uh, and will be a major uh, advance in, in our knowledge of HIV testing. There's also home HIV tests, which may increase testing, but also raise the concern about cost, uh, appropriate use, and also follow-ups to make sure that people who do test positive at home get entered into care. And finally, but not discussed on this slide, are rapid tests, which can be used in settings like emergency departments or urgent care centers uh, or during labor and delivery 
uh, when people need to get information rapidly or when people may not be necessarily uh, reliable or come back for uh, the results of their HIV test. Um, so again, just to kind of highlight what we've already gone over, 20% uh, of those who already have HIV do not know they're infected, which is why uh, this recommendation for universal screening is so important. And some people get tested rather late in the course of their illness, so that 32% of people actually are diagnosed with AIDS within one year of their HIV diagnosis. So that's why, again, we want to stress that everybody get HIV screening routinely at least one time between the ages of 15 and 65. When we look at barriers to testing, uh, it's important to recognize that not all health providers do testing routinely. Only 61% of general internists, primary care doctors, offer HIV testing regardless of risk. And 50% of emergency departments uh, were shown to be unaware of CDC's guidelines, and only 56% offered HIV testing in the study done and reported in 2011. Uh, a recent study of health centers showed that only 20% of a sample of uh, uh, federally qualified health centers were testing all pages, patients between the ages of 13 and 64, which was the CDC recommendation in 2006. Um, and the remaining sites only tested high-risk patients or those who asked to be tested. Uh, the study found that things that facilitated routine testing were actually funding for testing and community partnerships. I think funding is a, is a major barrier and resources are a major barrier for routine testing. And uh, I think another barrier is people's fear of getting results. And so we have to begin to treat all people without stigma and discrimination and help them realize that actually getting tested, regardless of whether they're negative or positive, will, can mean that they can still live a long life as long as they get appropriate care. Um, this was a photograph of a conference that I was at last week in Mississippi that we organized around HIV uh, care and testing. And uh, the director of one of the health centers from a rural area of Mississippi who implemented HIV testing said that the challenges she faced had to do with the attitude towards uh, people uh, needing testing and whether or not um, people were seeing people at risk for HIV in the health center, leadership within the health center to enact uh, appropriate screening uh, protocols, financing for the programs, and developing a system to do that. So I think that, um, again, this is an example from one health center in Clarksdale, Mississippi, but I think that um, this center has implemented a program and we need to follow uh, their best practices and do this elsewhere. I want to highlight that HIV testing has been shown to be both cost effective um, in the way that mammography is cost effective for women between the ages of 50 and 69 and the cost effectiveness improves with better linkage of HIV infected individuals to care, as we would expect. <clears throat> so that once someone gets tested, there's two possible outcomes. One is they can test positive. The second is they could test negative. If someone tests positive, it's important to think of two different things. One is helping that individual stay well, and the second is uh, ensuring that that person does not transmit HIV to any others. Well, there was an interesting study done in 2011, which I'll get to in a minute, but the recommendations for use of antiretroviral therapy from the CDC are that we treat people both to prevent the risk of infection and also to prevent transmission of HIV. And in terms of preventing risk of disease pro progression, it's recommended that therapy be begun as soon as someone is diagnosed with HIV, regardless of their CD4 count. And antiretroviral therapy is also recommended 
to prevent transmission of HIV, where studies have shown this most strongly in couples who are transmitting HIV from one to the other, but we can also extrapolate and assume that there will be protection for other people. Um, it's important that people starting antiretroviral therapy be willing and able to commit to treatment and understand the benefits and risks of therapy and the importance of adherence. People may choose to postpone therapy and providers on a case-by-case -case basis may elect to defer therapy based on a number of clinical or psychosocial factors. But overall, I think we should have a routine where as soon as someone tests positive, we're prepared to begin them on treatment. And these are just examples of three uh, treatments, but the reason I show this slide is not to go through the specifics of the drug, but to demonstrate that in order to communicate the ease of treatment with people, we need to show them a photograph of what their medications, or we could show them a photograph of what the medication looks like, uh, an illustration that's easy to understand of when to take the medication, and then some sense of what the potential side effects are so they can refer to this and raise issues if they have any questions uh, once they've started on therapy. Um, I also want to highlight in this slide, which is a little bit hard to see, that um, here at this, um, uh, in this particular uh, diagram here, that you can see that over the years from 2000 to 2006, that uh, among men who have sex with men, life expectancy has increased considerably due to treatment for HIV. And the same is true in other populations. It is not as true in, among inter intravenous drug users. But this is the reason why we recommend uh, this treatment and uh, why it's so important that we follow through. So the other piece, as I just mentioned, that we use treatment to help people who are infected, but we also use it based on a study that was reported in 2011. Uh, this slide depicts the results of a study of 1,763 healthy discordant couples around the world. Uh, all the individuals in the study started with CD4 counts that were relatively high between 350 to 550 but showed that early therapy was more effective than delayed therapy in preventing transmission from one member of the couple to the other. That is to say they were linked. So that in the group of people who started early antiretroviral therapy, there were only four infections uh, that came from this initial group who was treated early on. One was to a, uh, a linked partner, that is the person that they were in a relationship with, and three were the people who were not partners of theirs. Compared with people who delayed the start of therapy, that is to say they didn't start therapy until their CD4 count had gone down below 250, and in this category there were 35 infections, 27 of them to their partners, and eight to people other than their partners for overall a 96% relative risk reduction in linked transmissions of HIV. So this was a rather dramatic study which showed that by treating infected individuals effectively, we could decrease the transmission of HIV to others. And I think one of the uh, things that kind of interrupted this effectiveness was the lapse, uh, lapses in care so that if we see that people do not have suppressed viral loads, um, that can have an impact on the effectiveness of treatment as prevention, which is why, as I said in the beginning, it's very important that we not only begin people on medication, but make sure that they're, using, that they're adhering to the medication and that the viral load is monitored and is not detectable, so they're not passing on HIV to others. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when we talked about you know, people who are HIV positive, we also have to think about how we can help people who are HIV negative. Um, so there's now two approaches to this. One is 
for people who have an unsafe exposure um, by extrapolating from what we know of studies of, of infected healthcare workers. Post-exposure prophylaxis is also recommended for people who have non-occupational uh, exposure, um, sometimes referred to as NPEP. Um, so it's indicated for high-risk exposures to HIV-infected individuals and consists of basically four weeks of antiretroviral therapy. Um, earlier initiation uh, provides better efficacy, and generally it's not felt to be uh, useful if, it's, if, if PEP is initiated more than 72 hours after exposure. And someone would get HIV testing at the time of exposure and then one and three months later to make sure that they didn't get infected um, after receiving PEP. Another new approach to preventing HIV infection is called PrEP, or pre-exposure prophylaxis, which uses a single pill a day, and here's a photograph of one uh, version of the pill, which is a combination of two medications, emtricitabine and tenofovir, uh, and they're put together in a combination pill that an HIV uninfected person who's felt to be at high risk um, for potential infection can take every day. And the studies have been very uh, consistent at showing risk reduction for people who adhere to taking this medication. So the first of these studies to be reported, the IPREX study, um, which was partially done here at Fenway Health Center, um, showed that people who took uh, this combination of tenofovir and emtricitabine um, and was a study done in men who have sex with men and transgender women, reduced risk overall by 44 percent. But if you looked at people who were very adherent to medication, the risk reduction was over 70 percent. And this has now been shown to be true in other populations, including a recent study which isn't on this chart of uh, in injection drug users. These last two studies of women um, which were, where efficacy was not shown also, though, did demonstrate that these people were not adherent to their medication and did not have significant blood levels of the medication in their blood, which, re which reinforced the notion of adherence and adherence counseling as being very critical to the effectiveness of this medication. Uh, PrEP is easy to take. It's safe. There's no major safety concerns in the trials. There was some evidence of nausea and no difference in creatinine elevations or bone fractures, although they are potential toxicities from one of the medications. So these are very important issues for us to be thinking about. When we think about using PrEP, though, we have to think about it not just as a pill, but also a pill in combination with ongoing monitoring for uh, side effects as well as for adherence to the medication, because as I just mentioned, adherence is very, very important. Um, so overall, in summary, I'd like to just highlight uh, that as we look at both uh, arms of this um, treatment algorithm, that HIV disproportionately affects men who have sex with men and transgender individuals, mostly women. Um, HIV testing is the cornerstone of most prevention interventions. That treatment as prevention, PEP and PrEP, are powerful biobehavioral tools to decrease HIV incidence. And that health centers and patient-centered medical homes offer opportunities to create and improve HIV prevention programs. So I think that's an overall summary of what we just went through. And just to make sure that you know, what I'm going through today will be uh, posted uh, on the uh, public housing website and also on our website so that you can use this and get um, continuing education credits. But I think that we need to think about what strategies will optimize sustainable change so that we can think about really doing this in our health centers. I think the first is HIV testing has to be done uh, routinely 
and universally offered to people. Um, we have to translate best practices and disseminate them effectively. And we have to think about where we'll get funding to pay not only for the testing, but also for associated STI testing and for medications for prevention. Uh, many, uh, some state Medicaid programs are already saying that they will pay for PrEP for prevention. Uh, uh, the medication that I talked about is FDA approved and should be covered by Medicaid programs. But in states where, you're, where Medicaid is not expanded for people under 100% of the poverty level, it may be uh, less easy to uh, kind of provide payment for this. And this is something uh, that needs to be discussed on a local level. Um, and obviously, we have uh, to think about how to provide technical assistance to help health centers to implement these kinds of programs. I think we just to reiterate, there are structural challenges to HIV prevention implementation. These involve collaboration, um, and collaboration as a, as a way to remove barriers to implementation, consistency, and compensation. In terms of collaboration, I think historically there's been a separation between people who did counseling and testing and people who did care and treatment. But now we know that these can all be done together by combining screening, care, and treatment. There's interestingly been a recent study which shows that uh, counseling at the time of uh, initial screening is probably not necessary to the efficacy of follow-up, but more important is linkage to care and treatment. And so I think this can simplify the initial screening process and something that can be done um, in health centers throughout the country. I think we have to look outside our health centers to eliminate the kinds of barriers that we don't necessarily always think about when we're providing health care, um, but that um, we look outside the kinds of things we traditionally do in health centers and really think about looking at what the needs of our local population are, how to do peer navigation to get people in for uh, preventive care and uh, testing, and uh, then link them to care so that they can be effectively managed and that their care can be monitored carefully. We have to be thinking about other factors that affect health, such as employment, housing, education, and access to care. Uh, we've already heard some data about the need for housing. Stigma and discrimination, which has affected people's willingness to seek care, is something that we have to deal with and help people overcome, as well as the complex behavioral effects of these things, and also remove the bias in health care which leads us to think that either we're not taking care of people at risk for HIV or that we don't want to, because I think that everybody deserves equal access to health care, and that's something that is pretty much guaranteed under the uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, the next thing I wanted to highlight is consistency. Here we have a sort of unusual picture, but it's four dashboards from different kinds of aircraft. And you can see that if you don't have a consistent approach, if every provider does their own thing, it's hard to monitor what's going on. And it's hard to just kind of take over and manage a patient who's, who's been seen by someone else and maybe has a different way of doing things. So we need to establish consistent methodologies for screening, uh, care, and prevention in our health centers so that this is really then becomes really part of a system that all can adhere to both providers and patients. Um, and finally, we need to think about aligning resources with the epidemic. Here on the left-hand side, there's a slide in blue uh, which, has a, which, which identifies the proportion of Americans living with an HIV diagnosis in different states, and on the right, is the proportion of uh, HIV funding from the CDC uh, projected for fiscal year 2016. And we just need to make sure that these uh, 
match up. In the past, that hasn't been the case. But under CDC's new approaches, HIV prevention source resources will closely match the geographic of a, of burden of HIV. And this has to be true for, for research as well as uh, care and treatment. And so these are important things for us to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, what to do about states which are not expanding Medicaid. This current map shows in red the states which are not participating in Medicaid expansion, which leaves unprotected people who are under 100% uh, of the poverty level. And uh, we have to think about strategies to think to to provide HIV care for that group of people. My understanding is that there are a number of states, in addition to those already on this chart, that are now considering expansion, but we still have to assume that there will be some that do not. And clearly, one of the biggest areas that we have to look at is in the southeastern United States, where there's the highest concentration of HIV is also where is the highest concentration of states which are not participating in the Medicaid program. Um, here's another way of looking at this, but more than half of the nation's poor and uninsured live in states that are currently not participating in the expansion of Medicaid, and the share among blacks is even higher. So here, if you look at states on the left that are expanding versus states that aren't expanding, you can see that 68% of blacks 60% of whites, 49% of Hispanics, and 58% of, of all races live in states which are not expanding uh, their Medicaid programs. So again, I think this is something that is going to be a challenge for all of us. Finally, in closing, I want to just say that despite the talk of technology, of testing, and, and using medications to both treat people and uh, prevent HIV infection. Um, some in it, we have to think about what helps us spread innovations and how we speed the, to the spread of innovations uh, that aren't spreading quickly. Um, and I think that the key is that we yearn for frictionless technologic solutions, but people talking to people is still the way that norms and standards change. So this is a conversation and a dialogue that we begun today that we need to consider to talk about among ourselves as providers and I think between all kinds of providers who work together on healthcare teams, but also including the people who run our health centers and make sure that we're all getting on the same page in terms of developing effective programs for HIV prevention. At this point, we have time for some questions. And uh, if you have any additional uh, uh, questions, the, uh, I just would suggest that you uh, contact us at the Education Center at www.lgbthealtheducation.org, um, and we can um, get you information, uh, more information about this. So are there any questions? Thank you, uh, Dr. McAdam, for this uh, great presentation. We are going to start the uh, Q&A session. Uh, the very first question that we have is, uh, what other funding is available to health centers besides uh, Ryan White? Well, <clears throat> I mean, Ryan White funding is available to some health centers, but clearly not to all. I think that um, you know, the best source of funding for HIV um, prevention and care is really going to be um, that people routinely be cared for and that hopefully there will be many fewer uninsured people under the Affordable Care Act. Um, other funds that are available may be available through local state health departments, but I think what we really have to hope is that um, if more people are covered by uh, Medicaid as part of Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, that um, health centers will have an easier time affording both HIV uh, testing as well as uh, treatment and prevention uh, medications, um, because those should be available under state Medicaid programs 
as well as under health insurance uh, coverage, other health insurance coverage. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. McAdon. Uh, there is a question on uh, HIV testing. The uh, CDC recommends testing patients uh, at least once from 50, uh, from 15 to 65. Uh, do you know or is there any recommendation to test patients younger than 15 or older than 65 at this point? Um, the rec the, the C the, it's, it's not the CDC recommendation. It's, the CDC does recommend that, and so does the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. I think that, you know, testing people at an earlier age, a younger age, or an older age really depends on the kind of history you get from somebody in terms of the risk for HIV. So if someone younger than 15 is sexually active and um, I would definitely suggest that they get, you know, again, a first screening test and based on their history determine whether or not they need to be tested more routinely. Um, and the same thing is true for older people. So these, the, that standard is really something that should be, is true for everyone in the country, but that other people could be tested based on the history that you get as a clinician when you're seeing them. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. We have another question. Uh, uh, are there plans in place at the federal level housing to foster a stronger partnerships that will facilitate testing? Mm -hmm. Wait, like, I'm sorry, uh, I, missed the very, I missed the very beginning of what you said. Sure, sure. He said, uh, to the title of, of the program, are there plans in place at the federal level to foster stronger partnerships that would facilitate testing? Um, I think there are some federal grants to look at um, uh, partnerships, but I, I, you know, I can't really cite them, and I think they vary from state to state. Some I know some states do have programs. I do know that in many states now there are aid service organizations that are trying to partner with community health centers to offer what traditionally had been the services they provided um, and to try and work together with health centers to offer them um, uh, almost seamlessly among different organizations. So that's where I think health centers do need to, you know, kind of look at who is doing this in their community and see whether they can partner together to see whether there are ways to develop effective screening programs. But I also want to emphasize that screening is very is a very simple process, and that um, uh, you know it is something that by setting up a relatively straightforward, simple system, uh, health centers should be able to identify uh, the people that need testing or need screening based on uh, just looking through if they have an electronic health record or looking through their records. And it's also the kind of thing that um, should be, uh, that one might consider setting up uh, reminders in an electronic health record for people who haven't been screened yet. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. McAdam, uh, we have another question coming in. Uh, what, uh, do you have uh, any materials or Fengo has any materials to train a staff of patient provider health communication on uh, sensitive health topics such as HIV? Yes, in fact, we do. In fact, um, on our website and on the website of the National Association of Community Health Centers is a uh, brochure called Taking Routine, Sexual His Taking Routine Histories of Sexual Health, a System-Wide Approach for Health Centers. Um, and it's available uh, for free. All you have to do is print it out, and it goes through pretty much uh, all the questions that you would need to talk to someone about, uh, both in general and also in special populations like men who have sex with men and transgender people, uh, in terms of uh, helping people prevent uh, not only HIV infection, but um, sexually transmitted infections. Um, and uh, I think it would be, it's a very important resource. It also comes with a training guide, uh, so it's part of a toolkit. The training guide is a way of 
It's a PowerPoint presentation that a health center can use, download and use to train people in their health center about how to use this uh, toolkit. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much for that uh, information, uh, Dr. Webb. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. McAdam. Uh I have uh, another question coming in. Uh, what are the differences between programs and services for young people, middle-aged people, and all people serve at your health, uh, 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 in the health center or the health centers? Well, you know, again, I think health centers serve different populations, but we should be able to pretty much, I think that the issue is not different services, but that, you know, with younger people sometimes it takes a little bit longer to learn about issues of risk. They're a little bit more reluctant to talk about it. But we do need to talk about, as you can see, from the numbers of people who were infected between the ages of 13 and 24 and the rapid increase in those numbers, we really need to be talking about talking to people at all ages about risk of HIV. The other statistic that's important that I didn't mention is that it's estimated that by 2015, more than 50% of the people in the United States who are infected with HIV uh, will be over the age of 50. So that we, you know, we should not make assumptions that young people or old people are either not infected or not engaging in sex, which might put them at risk for HIV. And so discussing these issues with people of all ages is extremely important. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McAdon. Uh, there is one more question coming in. Is there a care delivery uh, model at Fenway specific to HIV patients? Is there a care what? A delivery model at Fenway specific? Well, in uh, fact, Fen the delivery model that we have at Fenway is actually that we've integrated HIV uh, prevention and care into our primary care practice. And so we don't have a separate HIV program. And I think increasingly people are finding that HIV care is much easier than it was in the past. It's less complex. It can be much easier than managing diabetes in many ways. With the real barriers to effective care or that you have a, you know, a clear program in place and that people need to overcome their bias and avoid stigma and discrimination and welcome people uh, to get HIV care, screening, and treatment, and that it be, you know, monitored carefully. But actually, a program can be relatively easily set up in the context of a mainstream primary care setting. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. McAdon. Uh, there is another question. Uh, what partnerships have been most effective in preventing HIV or treating HIV uh, patients uh, or HIV uh, in public housing residents? Well, I think that, you know, obviously the relationship between public housing and health care varies a lot across the country. I think there's like 76 uh, health centers that are directly in public housing. And so clearly in those situations, uh, you know, I'd say that, that there needs to be a very active approach to that health center really doing outreach within the, within the uh, housing that they are, where they're located, um, but that health centers which are separate from public housing um, have a challenge of working together with uh, public housing programs to develop effective um, outreach screening and linkage to care so that people can be efficiently and effectively treated. And sometimes that involves not just doing outreach, but arranging transportation for people um, so that they, you know, get to their appointments, uh, depending on how uh, close the health center is to the site where public housing is provided. And, and, you know, and I would add that obviously there are large numbers of people who need public housing but don't have it. So the same would be true for thinking about how we link uh, HIV outreach and prevention, uh, testing and prevention work to uh, uh, homeless uh, shelters. 
Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Makadan. Uh, I think that we don't have uh, more questions for you. I want to thank you one more time for this uh, outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, and we need uh, people like you to keep us abreast on uh, topics like uh, HIV, uh, and specifically for those uh, residents of public housing. Uh, to all of our attendees, uh, please complete the post a survey. Uh, this helps the National uh, Center for Health and Public Housing to improve our webinars. And if you have any training and technical assistance needs, please contact any of our talented staff members. And once again, uh, thank you very much for attending this webinar, and thank you uh, to Dr. McAdam. And thank you very much, Jose, and thanks everybody for attending. And if you do have any uh, further questions, please don't hesitate to uh, contact us through our email site, which is uh, lgbthealtheducation at fenwayhealth.org. And we're really, we're very pleased to be able to collaborate uh, with uh, the public housing group um, at North American Management uh, to be able to offer this program today. So thank you. Thanks once again. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Jose. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.